We're so excited to have all of our parents here and alhamdulillah to learn from your years of wisdom and um, experience with working with youth and children. Uh, alhamdulillah, our theme for this event, as um, Ms. Allah mentioned, uh, is uh, the heart of homemaking for fathers and mothers. And oftentimes when we think about homemaking, we usually think about it being the work of a mother and we think of things like cooking and knitting and preserving <laughs> things. Uh, but what we discussed in our meeting is that the home is an environment where um, everyone participates. Uh, fathers have a role in that home and the vibe that they create and the energy that they bring and the resources and, and the, the talents that they bring as well as mothers. And then also the children, right? They, they create the home and the space. Um, we felt and we, we, what we see right now in our society is that the institution of home and this concept of home where you know, um, fa a family lives and generations kind of thrive, where there's grandfathers present and aunts mm -hmm. and uncles and this vibrancy of how things are done with Ihsan. And um, it's kind of, you know, in a, in a decline and actually being kind of actively attacked. And our children are kind of being taught to be these autonomous kind of machines that have to leave the home and have to not be a part of the society that we, uh, or the atmosphere that we create in the home, inshallah. And our intention is to go back to those traditions that we've had for thousands and thousands of years and to kind of redefine what our role will be, and especially in how we communicate with our kids. And so we want to begin our program by kind of talking to our panelists, because I know that you all have a lot of experience in either your role as educators, obviously your role as parents, in seeing some of the stressors that are impacting our youth today. And I wanted to see if you guys can kind of talk from your experience some of the things that you see uh, that are that are impacting our home and our families today. So, inshallah. And definitely feel free to introduce yourselves. I know that Ms. Salah did, but if you want to say a little bit about yourself uh, before you begin, feel free to do so, inshallah. <laughs> so, okay, so if I was going to have a question to answer, the question would be, what are, what am I seeing that people are struggling with? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that's, it's interesting because we just came back from Thanksgiving break and um, got to spend a lot of time with family, a lot mm. of time with nieces and nephews talking about different issues. And um, one thing that came up, we have some nieces and nephews who are visiting and they're, they grew up in a different culture, uh, a different country. Uh, but they're visiting these days, and so they were in a bunch of different households watching families interact with one another. And one uh, compliment that they gave to uh, my siblings or parents, which I thought spoke uh, to a big issue, is that they were shocked at how open families are here about talking about things that are happening in society. And over and over they were like, we could never talk about these things with our mm -hmm. parents. Or our parents would never even admit that this problem existed because they wouldn't want us to know about it. But we do know about these problems. It's just that we're not talking about them in our home. So um, a lot of us are probably going to speak from our experiences with our children. And the phase that Zishan and I are in right now is um, our, I, I had to change my bio on my website because it said Hina Banakta is the mother of three young boys. But I had to change it to three young men because yeah. they're not little boys anymore, mashallah. So my eldest is 25, mm -hmm. my middle one is 23, and then my youngest is 18, mashallah. Sure. So a lot of our experiences are going to be talking about young men and boys. But that, if I was just going to pinpoint one thing that we can expand on later, and I'd like to hear from the others as well, um, I think communication between parents and children and open conversations and children feeling safe uh, talking about what's going on in their lives and what they're dealing with, I, I think that's one thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Anyone else want to add? Yeah, just on that. Um, so, I actually think we are uh, cooking and knitting and preserving at home. And, <laughs> I mean, cooking the, the, 
most important gifts, you know, which is our children. Uh, and that, uh, you know, based on the prophetic advice of Allah Sallam, where he says, your children are born on the fitra, and then every parent, you know, you hold them, you know, sit on you, you know, and then the parent molds that child, you know, into a Jew or Christian religion. But we mold them into whatever we want. We mold them to, you know, to love basketball or to love soccer or to or to love this or love, love that or hate this or hate that. So we are cooking the dish, right? And uh, and so um, I don't think it's a shortage of good intentions, of good hearts, or of good ideas. I think every parent wants their child to be to be uh, in in our context to be a good Muslim, to have good adab. To love God and the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to pray, uh, to be good to their neighbors, uh, and so it, all the parents want that, right? We all want these similar ideas. In general, we all we all we have a consensus on what goodness looks like, and but then what happens? Where the missing link, with all I and God knows best, is the methods, mm-hmm. you know, and and because culture is changing so rapidly. Those methods uh, are, are also so relevant. Mm-hmm. So, the way the way I pr- the way I see parenting is how can we strategically convey those principles that we all agree upon? Mm-hmm. And it's and good intentions are not enough. Mm-hmm. You know, and they are important and necessary. Okay, mm-hmm. but they're not sufficient. So, good intentions, good hearts. You know, uh, in- intelligence is not enough. So, it's those methods. That we can uh, that we can learn from um, from the, the you know the, the experience of our you know of our elders and of our community and that wisdom and what methods can we employ so that that that's how I see it. Yeah, that's just yeah. Nice. Brother Sean or Sister Emily. I don't know if you want to go on to the next question. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I I would just um, that was beautifully said. Um, you know, mashallah, what you're doing here is incredible because um, I always say um, child rearing. Well, when we were growing up here, I feel our parents were really focused on pouring the knowledge into the vessel. But society as a whole, um, even though we're products of public school, um, society as a whole with built healthy vessels. Mm-hmm. Um, although it was going askew, but it still wasn't where it is now. But I think that um, the vessel is broken, and the vessel is the child. So it doesn't matter what you're pouring into the child if you're not building a vessel that can contain truth, recognize beauty, then um, it's fruitless. Mm -hmm. So this kind of communication where schools, Islamic schools, are with the parents, um, I think it starts here. You're building the vessel because tarbiyah is the building of the vessel. And um, like Brother Mahdi and like Mahdi and, and Hina were saying, um, there are methods, inshallah, and we can talk about those. Yeah, for sure. Inshallah, we'll definitely get to the methods. And yeah. I think that's the key point, and I want to reserve as much time as we have for that. But I do want to say, like, um, you know, obviously, like you said, we've definitely seen um, the, the... In terms of passing on the wisdom... Uh, of the generations before us. Um, one of the things that we often see is like this um, rise of like innovation or modernity or what's new is, is the direction to go. Mm-hmm. And so we're always kind of wanting to forward, look forward. So, so talk a little bit about the need maybe of like retaining those wisdoms. I mean, at Peace Terrace, like one of the things that we're kind of gearing towards and have moved towards uh, slowly is the um, providing a classical education to our children. And the reason for that is not because we want to retain them or stunt their growth in, in terms of innovation or the future, but rather this concept of like the wisdom of the past. So maybe you all can talk a little bit about like what are some of the um, issues and principles that people of the past may not have had uh, that we have now in our society that uh, that impacts us. Like, I know, I mean, one of the biggest things that we can talk about is, like, screens, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> the, the newest Absolutely. thing. Yeah. So maybe talk a little bit about the impact of yeah. that. If you guys have dealt with youth or children, um, 
with with those things and what might be some of the impact of, of those kinds of things. <laughs> do you, do you um, wanna? I, mean, yeah. I would say um, one of the biggest ailments of modern society is individualism. Um, we're a rights-based society versus a duty-based society, which mm -hmm. our tradition was historically, and, and most Eastern traditions still are, um, duty-based societies. And how that translates is, you know, the breakdown of the family, right? Because when mm -hmm. everyone's, uh, just by the very definition of family, it's a, it's a duty-based, it's what can I do for the family versus mm -hmm. what can the family do for me? Um, and um, that, that individual, individualism is built through the nuance of language. Um, I Kind of the thing I say is um, words build worlds, right? Mm -hmm. And so as a parent, you're constantly giving your children their worldview through how you communicate with them. In very small ways, actually, it's such nuanced ways. It's Life is in the details, it's not in the grand gestures. So it's not in the lecture that you're giving, it's in how you're asking them to do this or that, and how you're, how you're, um, how you're you know, what, what worldview you're giving them mm -hmm. in that. But um, I'd say individualism is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, and screens are just a manifestation of that. I, you know, I think they're, they're a very tangible ailment, mm -hmm. um, but the underlying ailment is individualism. But yeah, screens are definitely a huge problem for our youth, uh, screen addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and I tell my students and my children, I tell them, you guys are, anytime there's a new technology, um, usually society kind of experiments with it, then they see the dangers of it, then they build laws around it, then they build education around it, and the, the culture kind of shifts. I mean, I use cars and seat belts, usually that's an easy mm -hmm. one. When cars were invented, there were no traffic lights, there were no seat belts, there was no driver's license, it just they were invented, and then accidents happen, and then laws. And in the 1970s, I don't think um, car seats were even <laughs> required yet. Now they'll call child CPS on you mm -hmm. if you don't have a car seat. So, you know, you're the experiment generation. Mm -hmm. I, in, in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I'm sure there are going to be laws. I know China just implemented, funnily enough, that Umtree, you know, I don't know, Umtree has a, um, a media policy where kids can only uh, watch three hours of, uh, engage with three hours of screen time a week. Um, China just implemented that for its kids, oh, wow. um, for its population. Mm -hmm. So the laws, the countries are following, you know, they're, they're yeah. seeing the damage. So yeah, definitely screen, screen awareness is a huge one mm -hmm. um, because it's breaking down the vessel. Mm -hmm. So. Sure. Yeah. What was the line you said? Teaching is in the details, not the grand gestures? Yeah. Because yeah. that, it's so true. That was something I definitely picked up on from Amira, like, um, how many of you here know the picture book, The Giving Tree, by Shel Silverstein? Mm -hmm. So The Giving Tree is a very popular picture book, and um, it, I always enjoyed it, reading it, and then I saw a critique written on it a few years ago, and I remember discussing it with Amira. So The Giving Tree, just a quick synopsis, it's about a tree that loves a little boy, and the little boy keeps coming back to the tree and keeps taking things from her one after the other, her branches, her leaves, her fruit, until there's like nothing left. She's basically cut down to a stump and he's still coming back to her for one thing after the other and she's still giving to him. And every time the boy spends a little bit of time with the tree, she's happy. And so the critique that was written about the book that's been so popular for so many, so many years was about how it was a terrible message and that you know the tree didn't have boundaries and the tree didn't have, you know, the boy was a little narcissist, and the tree was just giving and giving and being abused and didn't recognize that she was being abused. And basically, if we read this book to our boys, we're teaching them to be narcissists and to grow up, you know, uh, mistreating the women in their lives. And when I talked to Amira about it, Amira's take on it was completely different, which was that this book was about um, the exchange of love between a mother and a son, sure. and how a mother that's her role, that she'll give and give and give, and without really expecting anything in return. Obviously, it's the duty on the children and for us to model for them and to teach them about how to give back, but that the ultimate message of the book was a beautiful one. And so 
it's in those discussions that when you read picture books like that, mm -hmm. because I, what I always tell my kids, my students, is that every single book we read, now every movie, every video game, every song that you listen to, every single uh, form of entertainment that we're exposing ourselves to is giving us a message. And nobody's writing or creating unless they are putting a message out there that they want to share with the world. And not all messages are good messages. And it's up to us to learn how to decipher those messages. And so what I used to tell my kids is that um, I'm not going to teach you. Inshallah, my goal isn't to teach you what to think. It's to teach you how to think. Because you're not always going to be with us. But there's going to be certain parameters within which you have to learn how to decipher the world around you. Look at the world around you through the eye of discernment, as they say. And so that was, to me, an example of how you can choose to ban a book, you can choose to cancel it, you can choose to like be like, no, no, have nothing to do with it, or you can choose to engage with it with your kids, teaching them how to decipher the messaging that's given. And another dad at Elm Tree, he uh, told us about how he couldn't stand the movie Frozen, and it was the most popular movie. Every kid and their mother was watching it. But he didn't ban the movie. He didn't tell his kids, you can't watch the movie Frozen. He watched the movie with his kids. Mm -hmm. But then he told his kids what he had a problem with. And he would ask them, well, what do you think about the lyrics in the song that say, let it go, that the rules don't matter, right, wrong, you know, none of these matter. I'm free when I can do what I want. And, you know, getting the kids to think about, well, what are rules? What rules do rules play in our lives? What's sharia? What's fit? What would our worlds look like if we did away with all the rules in our lives? So in the end, the kids concluded that they still liked the movie. They still enjoyed it. But the dad managed to get his voice into his kids' heads, right? So um, and Imam Tahir also, he said that all dads should be playing the video games with their kids mm -hmm. so, so that you know what your get kids are playing mm -hmm. and what they're being taught. So um, that's just mm -hmm. one example of, like, how to, inshallah, um, help our kids help our kids to decide for the world around. And for me, I think um, what was said here is that I felt like the biggest blind spots of well-meaning, well-intentioned parents are the children. Mm -hmm. So I was raised at home, and because my father was praying, my mother was praying, they talked to us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we would be Muslims. But as I raised children, I realized there's a, there a generation gap. Mm -hmm. There's a continental gap, because they were raised in Pakistan, I was raised here. Mm -hmm. And then there's a societal gap. Meaning society has advanced so much and changed between when I was a kid to now. So there's these, not just one gap. We always know the generation gap. Yeah. We just talk to our kids and they don't get it, right? So there's these three gaps. And um, to not assume that because they're with you and you're nurturing them, you know, you're, you're doing all the homely things, that's not what's going to get the dean in their heart. And having that voice and uh, asking them open-ended questions about a movie like Frozen, like what do you think the message is? This really listening to them so you can understand um, it is is really important. I never received the talk from my father, mm -hmm. but I had to give the talk to my my boys. It was, mm -hmm. it was a new thing, and mm -hmm. you know you hear new fathers like, oh my God, when that day comes, you know, can you do it for me? And I've also done it for other people. So mm -hmm. we have to rely on the village. Uh, we have to rely on really, really not having those blind spots with our own children because. The children are, uh, they're your children, but they're also uh, so susceptible to the to what's going on in society and what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. So um, well-meaning parents, you know, with blind spots and, and really engaging, like, like was already mentioned, so it's very, very important. And then teaching the deen with love. I mean, my mm -hmm. first Quran teacher in Pakistan, I went for a summer, and he smacked me mm -hmm. while I was reading Quran. And that, I can tell you that that affected me because... The biggest thing that children can take is when religious people, you're, you're asking them to adopt a religion to learn a religion. But when people in that mode who are older than you behave badly, mm -hmm. right? They don't behave in, in, in accordance with the sunnah. Yeah. So it's very, very important to teach this religion and this society with so much love. Mm -hmm. And that's what brought me back to the religion while I was having very young children being married. And that's, I think, part of a very important yeah, inshallah. Uh, Definitely pray for that. Do you want to talk about maybe some of the ailments that you've seen, that you've faced in your different roles? 
You know, I think universally, Dr. Abdelhakim Murad says it, says it beautifully, um, we need to live in our time with timeless wisdom. Mm -hmm. So, um, though, said, said it another way, uh, we want to be rooted in our tradition and religion, but we want to be relevant mm -hmm. to our time. Um, we want to be connected to our, our texts in our context. Mm -hmm. um, you know, said three different ways. So, um, uh, you know, the ailments of today uh, are and the obstacles and the hills of today are different than they were when, when I was a child, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and so the challenges are different. Uh, but we still want to convey the same principles to, to those children. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so, so, so I think, again, it comes back to uh, some of those methods that we will, you know, that, that I've come to fall in love with. Mm. You know that I've that I've learned from others, yeah. and that I've seen very effective, um, and so you know that that's for me the exciting, the, the exciting, you know, al hikmat al dalat al mu'min, ainu wajadha afadha. Wisdom is the the lost property of the believer. Wherever he finds, he takes it. You know, if you find wisdom in frozen, take it. I don't know if there is any, but you know, uh, you know, maybe there is. Yeah. Maybe they're, they're perfection in art, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And we need to perfect our art in our schools. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, uh, so so that, that wisdom in parenting, you know, and coupled with the individualism of today where I want to do it on my own mm -hmm. and my ideas and my way and no one, no one you know, invade my space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and my boundaries and don't tell me what <laughs> yeah. to do because I'm free. So uh, that, that, that recipe... Uh, doesn't work to cook the dish that we want to cook yeah. for healthy, wholesome, happy children mm -hmm. that are ready to navigate this world as as as, as healthy Muslims. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I recently had a parent um, uh, reach out to me and said, um, "I think I believe that my child has a learning disability, mm -hmm. and um, she's unable to focus in school. She's unable to concentrate in class." She's unable to listen to directions and follow directions. Could you please assess her for me? Just to, you know, an overview to just see if, you know, um, she has a, a learning disability. And so I said, well, I, I, I'm not a professional. You definitely need to reach out to professionals, but I can definitely uh, come and spend some time with you. And so I did that. And, and one of the things that I left her with is that, you know, your child does not have a learning disability. Your child is uh, spoiled, <laughs> you, you know? You need to, every once in a while, say no and set those boundaries. And so if we are raising a generation of children who, like you said, are growing up that I am, you know, from the time that they're born and they're two years old and they learn the concept of mine and me and I, uh, they're big nifus. And so yeah. our whole life is spent in trying to temper that down in, within ourselves, like that nuffs, right? But in society now, we're just continuously seeing that grow and continuing to please, and being kind of feeding that flame and watching it grow more. Mm -hmm. And um, part of the thing that we're dealing with um, is an immense sense of like entitlement mm -hmm. and an immense sense of... Um, um, lack of gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I know, for example, for us, you know, growing up, and I think for our parents' generation, it was entirely different because even to our parents, we were like, you know, kind of on shaky ground. Mm -hmm. But growing up, we had this innate sense of like, my father works really hard, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. my mother works really hard. And uh, I remember uh, my older siblings would cry if my mom would be in the kitchen working and they were they she wouldn't let them like wash the dishes or do the laundry you know like if she was like no I want to do it myself they would really get emotional you know but we we don't have that you know kind of sense anymore or at least we're not seeing that within you know our children as we're as we're kind of dealing with the sense of individualism so um Yes. I'm going to jump onto that with the word yeah. spoiled. Because, you know, we live in a place where here a lot of us uh, have the ability to provide our children a lot of items, mm -hmm. objects, experiences. 
And so, and we like to do that as parents, to bring them joy and happiness. But there's a, there's a difference between being spoiled and pampered. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and both the spoiled child and the pampered child both receive the same gift, but the spoiled child is entitled, mm -hmm. and the pampered child is grateful. Mm -hmm. Even though they're receiving the same object, mm -hmm. right? And so, if, is it wrong to quote unquote pamper your child if they're grateful? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily wrong. Mm -hmm. If they're grateful, they appreciate it. You know, you can, uh, you know, I, I learned from a family where they give a, it's called the Quran gift, mm -hmm. where every chapter of the Quran that this child learns, their parent gets them a Quran gift. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's certain parameters, whatever, 10, 15, 20 dollars, whatever it is, you know, go to, yeah. it used to be go to Toys R Us, now it's Amazon, you know, <laughs> yeah. but you get a Quran gift, and then they make a Quran gift list, and you mm -hmm. know, and they memorize, you know, 10 chapters, and they can combine one and get a bigger gift, or whatever. Is that wrong? Are they being spoiled there, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but if they're, if, if it's a sense, if they have a sense of gratitude, mm -hmm. and they're grateful, then, then that's okay, you're, you're making, it's, it's a, it's a tool to help them fall in love with the Qur'an, mm -hmm. have a positive association and experience with the Qur'an, mm -hmm. right? They're receiving a gift as a reward, and they're not being spoiled. So, mm -hmm. so buying our children gifts or many gifts isn't necessarily wrong as long as it's being you know, processed in the correct way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I mean, but I, I do, I mean, are you, are you seeing within your, your, your spheres of whether Know, it's work and, and things like that. That that sense of gratitude increasing as more materialism is increasing. I mean, um, I'm definitely for yeah. rewarding children in terms of like you. Like I remember Ansa Tamara. One of the things that she said is, Muslims we have our festivals, and our festivals come after two periods of like immense trial, right? right. <laughs> so we, we're definitely, you know, working very hard during Ramadan and definitely during the journey of Hajj. And then, you know, and, and as you mentioned, this child who's working towards, I'm going to memorize the Quran or I'm going to learn the 99 names of Allah and I'm going to do this particular thing to please my parents. And so, um, and, and I think like everyone living according to their means, you know, is a great thing. And, rewarding children and, and giving them things that they can nurture and kind of hold on to is great. But as the materialism is kind of increasing, one of the things that we do see is, well, I saw this thing on TV and it looks really enticing and exciting. I want it now. And mm -hmm. then, you know, parent goes and works and kind of gets the thing. And then a few days later, it's like on the pile of the rest of the yeah. toys, mm -hmm. you know? So... You know, thinking about, like, we're, I think we're definitely in a position to be able to buy things and give our children experiences, maybe more so than our parents were, maybe more so than our grandparents were in some cases, because of just the environment that we're in and so on. But, but you know, setting those limitations within those things and learning to say no about those things, especially when we're seeing the heart's, impacted by those things with that sense of ingratitude is something that I think we have to kind of wage as parents and kind of weigh in, uh, in terms of what we want to do. So just moving on into our, our next topic, some of the things that um, um, we had come up with is... Um, can, I, can I just comment on that? Yeah, anything? go ahead. Well, oh, absolutely. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So um, uh, just, just some ideas because close it out and give some tangibles. I mean, um, we're dealing with a lot as parents, mm -hmm. right? We're dealing with so much. Like, there's so much. There's depression, there's anxiety, there's suicide, there's LGBTQ, there's, uh, there's um, uh, drugs, there's pornography. There's so much, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'm sure there's many others I didn't mention, okay? Um, but we have to choose our battles. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and we can't choose every battle, mm -hmm. right? And there's going to come a time where holding on, this time is holding on to right and trouble. Mm -hmm. and there will come a time where, and the one who holds on gets the reward of fifty sahaba, and the one oh. who does one tenth of the religion goes to jannah. When if they missed one tenth, they they would get punished for it. So mm -hmm. we're 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 arguably in yeah. that time. 
So we have to choose our battles. So, um, you know, yes, it's 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 not a nice feeling as a parent if I got my child a toy and then they threw it and they didn't use it two days later and then they want the next toy. Yeah, it's it's not cool. Um, however, um, we we want to we can't we can't compromise the the health of the relationship of the child with the parent or the child with God or the child with Islam for the sake of some five dollar toy. Mm -hmm. So in the idea of choosing our battles, mm -hmm. sometimes we have to have strategic compromises. Mm -hmm. Right? In other words, um, getting getting that five dollar toy, ten dollar toy, whatever it is, they now have what 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 we what what, what I understand what they say in Arabic, Ayn Shabana. Ayn Shabana. Their eyes their eyes say she oh. also in Arabic. That's what our teachers do, and the event goes off in the background here in class. You say the event, and then you continue. That's, that's the event. So, um, so um, there is a saying in Arabic, in proverb, and the forbidden is desired. And if we're raising our children where the forbidden is desired, mm -hmm. and they grow up mm -hmm. if they're 10, 15, now 20 years old, they feel deprived, they feel Islam deprived me of this, my parents deprived me of this, now they grow older, now they're, they blame Islam for this, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and so I want, we want our children to be satiated, my parents mm -hmm. made, I'm happy with my mm -hmm. children, they didn't deprive me. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Childhood. 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 So, oh, so they, when they grow up, now my parents didn't deprive me. Islam didn't deprive me. I'm a happy person. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm not going to grow up and now when I'm outside the house, I'm 18 years old, let me go sow my wild oats. Mm -hmm. And now I'm free. Let me go watch every single crazy movie. Let me go drink everything and try everything and do everything because I was never able to do anything in my youth, in my childhood. Right? Oh, absolutely. So, so the idea of choosing our battles strategically yeah. is something that we have we have to we have to face. We have to choose, you know, yeah. as parents. So, I'm challenging the notion of how right it is or wrong it is mm -hmm. that that toy is 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 not, is, is a little bit abused. Yeah. You know, maybe a little wasteful. Yeah. And maybe that's the compromise we we somewhat need to make in our context here, living in California in 2022. So we raise happy children that are not depressed, have anxiety, go to drugs, go to smoke, go to this, go to this, go to this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. you know, I have to work for my chores mm -hmm. yeah. and then buy my toys myself. Mm -hmm. And there's a very transactional part of it. But then I think with our children, it was like, I think Hannah read a book. It was like, at two years old, your child can, wants to help you and they can, you know, use a fake uh, broom or, mm -hmm. you know, one of those little brooms. Yeah. And they can also sort laundry by color. Oh, yeah. right. So those are very interesting things because then the child at a very early age is learning to contribute to what the family is doing. Mm -hmm. You're a team. Mm -hmm. It's not your parents are not your slaves, yeah. right? Yeah. So you're a team, and then the five year old can do the dishes and if, uh, no, set the set the plate, make the juice, mm -hmm. and then the older one can do. You know, there's there's gradations of what yeah. they're able to do. Yeah. But as you raise them and they want a toy, you say, "Mashallah, you're a good kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can have that." Mm -hmm. But because they're part of the team, yeah. it's not as transactional mm -hmm. as how I had it. Exactly. Right? I had, you know, go wash the car, mow the lawn, mm -hmm. blah, blah. I had these checklist things to do so I could buy a, a, a 10 speed bike. My father could have bought mm -hmm. the bike for me. But at the same time, if he had said, Mashallah, you're helping out, you're a good kid, here's the bike after, you know, several months. I think that sits better with the child in the society we're in. Oh, absolutely. So I think there's, there's that middle ground of like, having your children contribute to your family yeah. needs as a yeah. team. And Absolutely. then as they get older, like we're seeing, you know, it, it, it's just kind of a, it's, you don't have to shock it. It's yeah. just kind of natural that they have that ownership over the house. Yeah. So yeah. Inshallah, whatever's best. Um, to, to build just on that a little bit, um, and I think being spoiled is with 
words. Mm-hmm. It happens with words, not with actions. Um, and what you're rewarding mm-hmm. specifically. But um, even like building um, a, a family where every it's a team. Um, I noticed myself asking, I have three daughters, um, and uh, I would tell them, come help me in the kitchen. And they always say, of course, you know, they, they don't, they don't say no. But then I realized by, just by, and this is what I mean by words build worlds. Um, when I would say, come help me in the kitchen, what I'm implying, what's the unsaid thing? Because every statement has an unsaid paragraph. Yes. Mm-hmm. What's the premise behind that is, this is my job and you're helping me with my job. Mm-hmm. No, you're not. This is actually your job. I'm helping you. Mm-hmm. So I would say, well, let's clean the kitchen together. Mm-hmm. So I stopped asking them for help. And would ask them, do you need help? Mm-hmm. I can work with you. You know, so just kind of shifting that, like, um, come come do this with me is not come help me unless you actually do need help. When I need to make my bed, I'll say, hey, can you help me make my bed? Because mm-hmm. that's actually my, that's my responsibility mm-hmm. to make my own bed. Um, even when I had their brother, which they really wanted, I said, okay, on one condition, I'll help you. When you guys, <laughs> but he's yours. <laughs> but um, but no, it's it's that it's you you spoil kids with uh, words with expectations. It's um, how how you present the gift because gratitude. It's not something that it's it's a byproduct of resilience. Mm-hmm. People work towards gratitude without realizing that it, it takes foundational work before you get to gratitude. You can't mm-hmm. just, gratitude doesn't just manifest. You have to have some <coughs> foundational things as a human. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of them, one of the strongest ones, and one of the most important ones is resilience. Because mm-hmm. if you're not resilient, you can't hear the word no. Mm-hmm. You can't, um, you're presented with too many choices because choices equal disappoint. Choices equal disappointment. Um, then you can't be grateful. There's just no way. And you're spoiled. You are therefore spoiled. Yeah. And resilience yeah. is also, there, there are methods, and that's what terbiya is, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell my kids sometimes, it's, it's my job to make sure, to make sure that you're uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, Mama, you're supposed to make us comfortable. <laughs> no. Because only the people that love you most can make you uncomfortable successfully so that when you're older, you learn how to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. That comfort comes from within, not from without. Mm-hmm. So it's just that that's where spoiling. It's not through um, materialism as much as how that materialism comes into their household, into their hands, mm-hmm. and their relationship with the material. So, oh, absolutely. Um, no, I have no doubt about it. I yeah. absolutely agree yeah. with With gratitude, I'd also say that it's embedded in the, in the prophetic du'as. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it's important for me as a father to translate the du'as for them in their, in their five-year-old language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, in yeah. their seven-year-old language and their three-year-old language, because mm-hmm. they can say this drop for twenty years and never know what, yeah, it, means. what it means. Exactly. You know? yeah. So the drop for food, it intrinsically has gratitude mm-hmm. that this food that you gave me. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know? yeah. uh, the drop for clothes, mm-hmm. kasani that you clothed me. Yes. You know, uh, and so also like when we, if someone gives their their child a toy, mm-hmm. you you can encourage them. Uh, do uh, sujud shukr. Mm. Do sujud shukr. And then, you know, they go bow on the ground and they say, thank you, Allah, shukran, Allah, shukran, Allah. So in that moment, in that moment, you know, you're it, you're using the prophetic du'as and the prophetic methods to imbue in them with shukr. Yep, exactly. Right? And, and mm-hmm. to remind them that, you know, when you give your child medicine, you say, you know, is the medicine curing you or is Allah curing you? Mm-hmm. Is the medicine curing you? No. They're four, they're four years old. Mm-hmm. Is this medicine curing you? No. Then who's curing you? Allah. Then you give them the medicine in their mouth. Mm-hmm. You know? So and these are all Islamic concepts, Islamic athlete, yeah. Islamic hadith, Islamic du'a. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's almost time for prayer, but just one last question on this or one kind of comment on this. Um, do you guys want to maybe some of you want to tackle um, the roles of mothers and fathers or men and women within the home in so, in society today? Mm-hmm. Um there just seems to be so much confusion, mm-hmm. so much mixed messaging. And so as parents, we're often left with what is the dad's job and what is the mom's job and how do we define those roles and how do we create those spectrums? So what, you know, what 
or the teachings, obviously, of, a, of our prophet so but that's also that's wisdoms of, of, of our past. Yeah. Right? And, and some of the things that we're seeing today is definitely a lot of confusion, a lot of mixed messaging uh, <coughs> around those kinds of things. So I don't know if anyone wants to talk about um, about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Are there defined roles? Absolutely. When, when are we going to break for break? <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah, we've got 20 minutes. Yeah. We go 15. We've got 15 minutes yeah. 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 to yeah. tackle this one. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, yeah. There's definitely <laughs> roles. Uh, <laughs> if that's the question, there are definitely male and female roles. There's, I think everybody has a responsibility in the household. It's not about male versus female, mother versus father. It's about how you work together as a team. The child, the elder, the the father, the mother. Um, it was really nice in the past because there was, it, it wasn't the, the the household wasn't about the woman and the man. It was about a family. There were elders there. There was the elders of the elders. Mm. I mean, it was just so beautiful. Mm. It was an upward-facing society, not a downward. Now we're very child-centric, right? Um, but it, it's really important that as a mother, I mean, I find it's, it's important to for my own daughters and for my own sons to show that there are roles and to honor those roles. Um, it doesn't mean um, that... Uh, you know, men don't work in the household and women don't work outside of the household. That's not what it means. It's it's actually just in, in um, I think people lo lose their sense of role and duty in a, in a household with their words. Again, mm. it just goes back to words. It's not about, like, I, I want my daughters to see me, um, I know this can be so controversial, <coughs> but even though I know I can go somewhere, it's not a question of whether I can or can't. It's out of adab for this partnership that I ask. Mm. you know they need to witness that mm -hmm. um, otherwise it's just like well it's, it's again it's my right my right mm -hmm. versus my duty my duty um, so it is important to reinforce roles in the household especially considering everything that's out there um, and honoring our daughters and honoring our sons um, I growing up I had four brothers <laughs> and mm. I'm an only girl mm. um, so that can translate into a nightmare because, like, you could be serving your brothers, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. that didn't happen in my household. I mean, my daughter, my, my father treated me like a, my name is literally princess. Mm -hmm. um, that's, <laughs> that's how it translates. Um, but, I mean, and, and I served in my household, but, like, my brothers took out the garbage, mm -hmm. for example. They cleaned the cars. It's not that I couldn't, mm -hmm. but I didn't have to, right? Mm -hmm. um, so honoring females and honoring males um, through their roles is, is really important. And then modeling it as parents with, uh, through respect and through language. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear what uh, yeah. Shine and Nina have to say. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to tag, tag, tag on to Nina. Uh, so I, 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 I think it's cool for the, for the parents to tag team. Mm -hmm. To tag team. Meaning I uplift mm -hmm. mom in front of the children, she uplifts dad in front of the children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that way it's more honorable. It's not like me uplifting myself in front of the children and her yeah. uplifting herself in front of the children. Another way is, let's say there is a moment of, you know, tension with your discipline or something between the father and the child. You know, I'll go to Amida and be like, don't tell her, don't tease her. <laughs> yeah. You know? Don't tell her. You know, kiss her yeah. you know, and likewise, if she's having something, she'll Amida come to me and say, so and so, go tell her to come. You know. So if I tell my daughter, "Hey, go, you know, kiss your mom's hand and tell her sorry," it's yeah. beautiful. If she says the same thing, go, you know. So it's this tag team. You know, someone once said that you know we love Allah the most, Rasulullah and then mom, and then dad mm. with love, and then they say we obey Allah, Rasulullah, dad, and mom. <laughs> you can feel free to take it or not take it, but like, which one is yeah. like? Well, hold on, but I love mom more. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's not like this one is higher or this one's lower, because you love mom more, mm -hmm. right? According to the prophetic hadith, yeah, you love absolutely. Entitled to my care and my mm -hmm. my devotion, my love, my mm -hmm. you know your mom and then who your mom and then who and your mom and then who mm -hmm. and then your dad, you know. Yeah. That's so, not <laughs> it's not fair. That's a bad statement. <laughs> right? But then, but then obedience sometimes, well, yeah. is, the, is the father the leader of the house. And so, but if the, if the father is implementing that in his house, 
it, it doesn't work. But if the mom is the one supporting that, mm -hmm. you know, honor your father, and yeah. honor your father, honor your father, then it works. Mm -hmm. And then it's honorable. And yeah. then it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's smooth, it's gentle, it's lovely. But if the father is self-imposing it, yeah. you know, yeah. then it doesn't come out right. Yeah. Yeah. So the tag team is so important. Yeah. It's, it can't be like, well, I discipline my child and then mom comes and says, why'd you do this to so-and-so? Yes, so you know, funny. how dare you? You know what? Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're, you belittle the father yeah. or, or vice versa. Why'd you say this? At, you know, you can't do that. You're undermining each other. Mm -hmm. mixed messages. You know, mixed messages. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd love to hear again. No, that's know? exact. Ditto. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, language is, you know, there's this concept that dad works eight hours and then the mom's work is never done. Yeah. This is paradigm in society that, oh, we do eight, but they do twenty-four, so it's not yeah. fair. So, but but you know the the work and the quality of work and the, the slings and arrows that you take in each job are very different. Yeah. I mean, I have a commute, I have a boss, yeah. I have work that needs to be done, um, I have pressure, I could get fired. A woman has the right to be supported. But the days are longer, right? The yeah. days are longer. So there is a there is a balance there. Like I said, in one sense. We have one quality that is given to us, and another quality, we have a responsibility with that quality. And so, I mean, we started out as friends, uh, but we've always maintained a friendship, and I never undermine her mm -hmm. feminine nature. Mm -hmm. her, I have three boys, so we don't have the, the, the luxury of a daughter. Uh, we tried. The third one was supposed to be a girl. <laughs> <laughs> we let him know that. <laughs> but, you know, we never undermine our role. So yeah. it's very important for all your dad. If the, like, the language is, I have my hands full over here, and your dad won't even pick up the cup, and he won't even do the laundry. He knows the, he knows the uh, washing machine's full of stuff. <laughs> if you're using that kind of language around your children, yeah. You're emasculating your husband because you're Absolutely. you're you're treating him and his role with contempt. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing the walls and the sugar and the water and the washing machine. You're only seeing the load, right? You're only seeing the load. Mm -hmm. That's very myopic, and so that's why sugar is such. It's it's the root. Sugar and love is the root of everything. Yeah. And so when you think that that laundry is there, but then the washing machine and the water and the bills come from, you won't have that attitude. But what's really important, that's kind of a tangent, <laughs> what's really important is the is honoring the person by giving them the benefit of the doubt, saying, um, okay, if, 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 if he, didn't, he didn't see it, I just need to ask. Mm -hmm. you know, he came home, he could be thinking about a terrible day. His mind is not on, oh, look, the laundry machine's full. Yeah. You know, that's not how we operate. Yeah. And so giving each other the benefit of the doubt, I think, is really important. Using the language, the, the words, the worlds, like that's beautiful, Ashala, because, um, you know, that's up. And then I had three things that I, my wife knew I was re I'm really good at. I'm good at chopping. <laughs> I love using the knife. I think I'm a samurai. And, um, I like to read to the children because a lot of times I wasn't, well, I wasn't read to. And I, I have exposure to books uh, through my children, which I learned a lot through. And the other thing is I like to bathe them and put them in bed. So she knew that these are his strengths. These are the things. I'm not going to ask him to do these other things. I'm not going to ask him to cook. He can chop. But I, and then she knew that during that time, those things, he'll take care of it. I'll get my break. I'll get my downtime. And again, it was like, oh, can I do this with my friends? Can I do that? It's that, having that respect with each other as a teamwork. So, um, you know, just adding on to what was already beautifully said. Do you want to? Well, I, I honestly think everything was said. No, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, I remember growing up, um, I never saw my parents fighting, like ever. I don't think I've, there's one time when I witnessed an argument that they were in. And so I just thought they just got along really well, and that there was never any tension between them, you know, ever. And so as an adult, I, I said, you know, I, I talked to my mom one night, and I was like, how did you guys have this connection? You never fought. And one of the things, I, my mom just started laughing and saying, we just never fought and argued in front of you. <laughs> and uh, I was, it was very eye-opening, but I think connecting it back to what you said is, I don't think they ever wanted us as children to witness them being dealing with some of the adult things that they were dealing with or some of the pressures of life that they were dealing with. And so we never got the sense of, you know, not only like discord within the home, but also 
disrespect towards each other. Yeah. Language that was used mm -hmm. that might have been disrespectful or tensions that might have been within their marriage that might have been, you know, uh, impactful. And so one of the things that, you know, practice that I want to put, uh, that I implemented in our family and in, in, in my own household was this concept of we're not going to argue in front of our children. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was just something uh, that really, I think, is a positive thing, you know, kind of the wisdom that we took away from our parents, mashallah. So I absolutely agree. Um, yeah, I mean, I think defined roles, you know, when you study the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and you see the examples of who he was as, as so many different spectrums of roles, and then you hear the fact that he also, you know, took care of his household and was at the service of his household and maintained his own chair, chores and things like that. Um, it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling mm -hmm. to see that level of, mashallah, beauty. Yeah, and I think I think our tradition doesn't boil down the human to their utilitarian value, mm -hmm. and that's the, like even the idea of gender roles. I, I'd like to even um, the premise of that is that we're all very utilitarian. The, the, exactly. the society is very yeah. utilitarian. We have responsibilities mm -hmm. as females, and we have natural characteristics. The female, of course, there's a spectrum for everything, but the female and the male, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has imbued the male with with characteristics and imbued the female with characteristics. And these characteristics lend to certain types of responsibilities and roles. Mm -hmm. And they can cross mingle because all of us have th that whole spectrum, but girls tend to be, you know, with mercy and um, we have more rahma. I mean, mm -hmm. that is the, that is in yeah. the biology of a female, the mercy, the mm -hmm. rahim, right? And, um, Men, they have like the futuwa and the responsibility and the like honoring and the safety and mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I mean, one metaphor that I love is um, men are like the, the palms that carry mm -hmm. the household within, you know, and, and the, they carry the woman, right? Mm -hmm. they, they're there to like my brothers. Mm -hmm. They're my honor, and mm -hmm. I feel it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they're not my competition, and neither am I theirs. Exactly. Um, and I think because we're in such a utilitarian society, everything is competition. Mm -hmm. Everything is, you know, one-upping the other. And unfortunately, that's blood, town, blood down into the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. but historically, it wasn't it, that, that whole thing of gender roles didn't even exist as a concept. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I think, a lot of things is, a lot of the things we're being pushed up against in today's yeah. ailments, mm -hmm. like if you're talking about modern ailments, is that these concepts didn't exist. They didn't even exist linguistically. I mean, Arabic is such a beautiful language, but um, it was my aunt. She was just like, "Oh, you want to save your kids? Just don't teach them. Don't teach them English." I was like, "Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we live in America." She was like, "Try to say self care in Arabic. Yeah, it sounds silly." <laughs> or personal space. You know, these because the, the, these words, you know, they don't exist. Yeah, right? self service. There's or self service. Self -service you know, yeah. Um, yeah. or self care. Um, all these things, all these concepts, so, so gender roles, it's, it translate that into Arabic, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. it's, it's not about that. It's beyond that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, definitely. It's a very beautiful way to think about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the one of the things watching or have babies, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's this quality that Amira mentioned, which is I could be asleep, and then she can hear the child in the very, very lowest tone cry mm -hmm. and get up and go, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how do you do that? How do you mm -hmm. have this radar that does that? Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, the men were the ones that could ar have an argument in the home or be displeased with something that was going on, and then still go outside and in the old days track an animal and shoot the arrow true. Mm -hmm cloud off all those other things that are happening. Mm -hmm. So in the village days, we had this separation of duties. You had mm -hmm. the CEO and the CFO. One's good mm -hmm. with money, one's good with selling. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Every company has that. But yet we don't have this differential. This modern society is telling the family unit, don't have these differential roles. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got to play everything and be yeah. an all-rounder. Yeah. You don't want your engineer doing the accounting. Exactly. Yeah. Right? You don't want to invest in a company that would do that. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, we have to honor these special abilities that we have mm -hmm. and and, yeah. and notice the beauty in them even though everything comes with the double edged sword mm -hmm. so that emotion and that nurturing comes with mm -hmm. comes with the negative 
And mm -hmm. our being able to block it out comes with a negative. Mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, he doesn't see things. Yeah. You yeah. know, those kinds of things. So <laughs> yeah. we're not your girlfriends. I mean, we can process, <laughs> yeah. but at some point we just kind of stop. Yeah. You know, like, you know, and so, you know, yeah. that's, that's all we have time for. Yeah, inshallah. So we're going to go ahead and take a, a break for prayer, inshallah. And then when we come back, inshallah, we're going to talk about uh, what does going back to the source look like? And what does a home with harmony um, and peace and love and compassion and all these beautiful, noble qualities actually look and feel like? And uh, get into some of the solutions right. and some of the ideas and some That's of the right. methods that you were talking methods, about. Yeah. Because it's really important for us to leave with something tangible, tangible yeah. for us to be able to implement in our homes and within our children and within our families, inshallah. So I'm looking forward to the second part of the discussion to get to um, some of those um, methods and some of those solutions. Because uh, just having the knowledge of doing something um, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to carry it out. And as um, Asad Mehdi mentioned, we definitely need to know the how. And I think one of the things that you said in terms of like the three gaps that we have, it's not just generational, right? It's not just like adults, child, but so many other factors that we're kind of dealing with. So it's important for us to be able to have those tools to, to address, uh, address uh, our children and, and, and to make sure that our homes are healthy, inshallah. Uh, before we get that, um, one of the things that kind of came up from my discussions during our break was addressing maybe single parents as well um, in our um, in our conversations and making sure that we're kind of maybe touching on some points of uh, you know single parent homes and then also like you know when we're talking about roles sometimes like in reality we don't have choices around certain things so it's really great when you have a choice to just be a mom at home and yeah, raise absolutely. your kids and not have to worry about going and, yeah. and supporting your family. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we definitely don't have those choices. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so talking a little bit about that, because when, it, you know, when it's ideal, you know, where everyone, everything is defined, obviously it makes, yeah. uh, it, makes it a lot easier. But sometimes when those... You know, you might have a mom that's the breadwinner, that's the main breadwinner in a home. And you might have a dad that's, that's not. And so in these points of conflict, sometimes, you know, our expectations kind of set the tone around uh, and can create additional conflict. So, so maybe getting um, a little bit into that. Um, uh, in terms of, like, not necessarily having a choice around certain things. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, going back to our topic, what does going back to the source look like? What does the, what is a home with harmony and um, presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remembrance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all those ideals that, that we want in our homes? And um, I agree with Asad Mahdi, the lack of intention and goodwill is not the issue. How do we achieve that? How do we begin that? How do we begin that journey today? Um, and for those of us, uh, those of our audience members who, who may not be, um, you know, in, the, in that perfect situation yet, how do they kind of come to terms and begin anew? So some ideas around those things that would be really great. Well, I would touch on something that Brother Mahdi had mentioned earlier about, you know, how the forbidden is desired. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I, I feel I was given um, by an elder is she said that for every haram that you stop your children from, you have to give them two halals that they can enjoy. <laughs> so that, that awareness that parenting requires a lot of creativity, it requires generosity, it requires going ex the extra mile like we were talking about, like paying more than you may have wanted to pay for an experience for your children to have a positive association with Islam. And so, because there's so many things pulling at our kids in society, it's really, really important that um, what their experience with the deen is, that it be very positive and be very joyful. And like, yeah, we teach our children to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fear Him, but the early years, majority of the focus, I would say, should be on the love. 
there's a time where you make your kids aware of the majesty of Allah and aware of the consequences and repercussions and real fear and awe. And that especially has to be there in the teenage years. But the early years when they're little, preschool, you know, toddlers, preschoolers, elementary school, the whole approach to the deen, I think what I've seen successful with many families is when it comes from a place of joy and it comes from a place of love. Um, I know. the story of Asli Oh, yeah. And so, like, one example of, of being creative mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, like, our community, uh, I, I don't know how people here feel, but I'll just say that in our community, the like-minded families pretty much came to the conclusion that they weren't going to celebrate Halloween and they weren't going to, you know, support that in their households. And so um, everyone can have their personal opinion on the matter, but that's what it was in our community. But instead of just telling the kids, oh, Halloween's haram, or we don't celebrate ha Halloween, um, instead being creative and coming up with an event on October 31st that wasn't called Halloween, and um, <laughs> but was you know full of joy, creativity, you know, sang nasheeds. We were you know on a ranch, did a bonfire, did hay rides, did face painting that wasn't morbid or ghoulish or macabre, and um, you know for years that was the alternative that we had for Halloween. And then when my son went to high school. And then he had, he was in public high school and he had friends who were celebrating Halloween and going trick or treating. I asked him once that, do you ever feel that you missed out? Do you ever feel like this important rite of passage, all these kids, you know, are doing this, that you, you didn't get to experience it. <clears throat> and I remember that he actually thought about it. He said, you know, because we used to call that event November's Eve. So he said, you know, if I didn't have November's Eve, then maybe I would have felt that way mm -hmm. for sure. But I always had somewhere fun to go. And when the neighbors or other kids would ask me, what are you doing? I was able to say, oh, I'm going somewhere fun. We're going to be doing something fun. So I don't, I didn't feel I missed out. And what that points to is that, because I res recently read something that a scholar wrote about having a conversation with his child about Halloween. And his emphasis, his child's still pretty young, his emphasis was on, his kid being a strong enough Muslim to talk, stand up to everybody and tell them why we don't celebrate Halloween. But the truth of what I've seen, majority of kids, is they don't want to proselytize. Mm -hmm. they, they don't want to go around trying to convince anybody of that their way is the right way. They just want to fit in. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they want to be doing something fun. They want to be able to prove they're doing something fun. And so for the most part, it's like if, if we can give our kids alternatives that they can be proud of, and feel like they're not missing out on, mm -hmm. then inshallah, you know, yeah, hopefully. Absolutely. And another piece of advice that was really, really good is we actually asked Amut Tarif, uh, Matthew and Amira's uncle, that, um, you know, with all the craziness out there, everything that's going on, like, how do we protect our kids? Like, the whole world just feels upside down right now. And he said, you know, with every storm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, every hurricane, every tornado, every typhoon, he's created the eye of the storm, the center, which is calm and peaceful and things aren't swirling around and aren't crazy. He said, you have to make your home the eye of that storm Absolutely. so that no matter what's going on around you, like the kids have a solid base mm -hmm. where they're seeing mm -hmm. um, things peaceful and they see Islam being practiced, they see Islam working, um, they see joy. Mm -hmm. So yes, inshallah, if those are the nouns that they're associating with their deen, then inshallah, inshallah. We want them to hold on to the deen because they recognize it as the truth with a capital T. Mm -hmm. But we also want them to see that Islam benefited them yeah, and that it worked yeah. for their families. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, going off uh, Amal Tarif um, and the single parent, that um, because you know we're talking here about parenting and we're assuming that every household has two parents, and that's not the reality for many households. And I'm going to tell you for my uncle, he was uh, married to my mom's identical twin, and she passed away when her children were 13, 11, 7, and, or 8, and 6. Um, and they were raised by a single father um, for a very long time. And um, subhanAllah, from all the cousins, they're probably the healthiest, most well-adjusted from all of us. Um, and what I learned through that experience and what my mother taught me is that 
First of all, parents are just, um, we're like vessels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for these human beings through us. But when he removes a vessel, does it mean he's not still providing in other ways? Mm -hmm. And I saw that through my cousins. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu was, was raised by a single mother. Uh, many of our prophets were. Yeah. Um, some of our greatest scholars were raised by single parents. So parent, parenting, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is providing for your children through you. And sometimes it's going to be you by yourself. Sometimes it's going to be you with a partner. And sometimes, inshallah, it's you with a village. But um, to just really remember that, you know, having that kind of tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And something I learned from Hina is that, you know, as much as you do and you do and you do and you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the turner of hearts. All these children, mm -hmm. they actually belong to God. And everything we do can provide, can, like the outcomes are not in our hands. So, you know, may Allah protect these kids. Um, Amen. Amen. And protect our parents, you know, protect okay. all of us, um, and protect these marriages. Sometimes a single a child growing up in a single household is infinitely more healthy than one in a broken marriage. So, you know, protect these marriages, protect all of this, because, mm -hmm. you know, we have a lot. Um, there's a lot for our, going against our kids, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, may Allah protect them. So I just wanted to put that out there, that being a... A single parent it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his hand is there with you so yeah. you're you might be better off than two two parent households <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah so just wanted to add that um, do you want to talk about a joyful home yeah um, so uh, so I prepared um, uh, for this and uh, and so I'm going to share um, your permission and your blessing. I'm going to share what 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 I'm really passionate about sharing with this parenting, um, and I'm going to share um, in uh, three or four minutes twenty methods. Right. So if you're the note taker, take notes because these are uh, things that are just that I've benefited from tremendously. So it's literally twenty different bullet points. So just me that. So. Uh, First of all, du'a, 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 and then after that, du'a, and then after that, du'a, <laughs> after that, du'a, and then after that, du'a. If I just said du'a until the end of the session, we would be better off than anything else. Yeah, I'm serious. Like, like the, the best strategy is du'a. Like before you want to go and help, du'a, you know, and then after that, du'a. Because Allah can take care of your child's heart or that flaw or that trick or that thing you want them to do or stop doing. Like, it's like, Allah, I can't do it, but you can't. Yeah, Allah, I can't do it, but you can't. You know, so dua is so critical, so critical. Um, so number two, uh, there's this really cool concept. It's called the four quadrants with parenting. It's on two axes. It's firmness and kindness. And so the first quadrant is high kindness, high firmness. Then there's high kindness, low firmness. There's high firmness, low kindness. And low firmness, low kindness. We want to be in high firmness, high kindness. They, they develop and raise the healthiest, happiest children who, who, who feel loved and who are also uh, mature and have edit. If we have high kindness, low firmness, they're loved, but they're spoiled, they have no edit. If we have high firmness, low kindness, then they're disciplined, but they're resentful and they don't have healthy relationships. And then low firmness, low kindness, there's no edit, no discipline, no love. Right? So that's two. So, and then number three, the child is not the boss. This is very important. You need to decide that mm -hmm. before you even have children or when your child is like one year old. My child is not the boss. Because when they throw a tantrum when they're one year old and one and a half, you have to, you have to believe my child is not the boss. If you don't believe that, parenting is going to fail. If, if I don't believe that I'm the boss and I let my child be the boss and I need my child's permission, my parenting will fail. I cannot teach them anything. Not when they're two years old, not when they're five, not when they're 10, not when they're 15. If the child's the boss, I fail. And I only have like two and a half minutes, so I can't get into all these things. Okay? Um, right? They, a child, if a child, number four, if a child expects no, it's healthier than expecting yes. Why? Because if they expect no, then when you say no, then you met their expectations. And if they, if they get yes, then they're so excited and happy. Now, if they expect yes, then when they get yes, okay. 
And if they get no, they're unhappy. So you set them up, if they expect no, you set them up for a satisfaction or happiness. If they expect no, you set them up for a satisfaction or unhappiness. Disappointment. You see? So it's strategic, so they should expect to know. Right? Okay, uh, next is this whole group, uh, elders, cousins, aunts, uncles. Don't get involved. You're not, I'm not the best parent. You're not the best parent. Let elders do their thing. Let uncles do their thing. Let aunts do their thing. Even if they're going to feed them five pounds of chocolate, it's okay. Okay? Even if grandparents are going to feed them, it's okay. Even if they're going to let them watch something that, that you don't really love, it's okay. These are all convert into teachable moments. Right? And then it shows, number one, it shows that you're teaching them to have adept to elders. Because you don't want to undermine that. Because if you undermine that, one day they're going to disrespect you as an elder. When you're their grandparent. Or their, you're the grandparent. Okay, like for example, in a, one time, me and Amita, we had a four-month-old baby. We were going to Chicago. My baby was four months old. I looked on the plane. I looked at my wife. I was like, you know what grandpa's going to do? <laughs> All this baby's had is nursing mother's milk. Grandpa's going to feed it. The moment we get there at midnight. And I was like, you know what we're going to do? And we have a deal that we, we honor grandparents and we don't get involved. Because we don't want to sever those relationships and build tension and all that. So we let them do what they're going to do. We get there at midnight, of course. Grandma <laughs> cooked a feast. It's like 1 a.m. There's this feast. There's yabra. You know yabra? Stuff grape leaves. So my dad's like, Ato, Ato, no, give me, give me it. He takes this four-month-old off mother's milk. He takes the yabra, the stuffed grape leaves. It's like, come here, my boy. Come here. <laughs> the first thing he ever had was yabra as a four-month-old, right? And then he took the piece of lime. He's like, come here, come here, my son. And me and Manita are like, <laughs> right? And we didn't say anything. Yeah. And my daughters are all learning because my daughters are older. And they're observing us being silent, observing us respecting, you know. And then it's okay. It, the 99% they're at home, they're with us. 1% they're with others. That's fine. Okay, all right. Number <laughs> number six. Okay, number number six. Um, this is really cool. Um, this is about making moments. Making a, nothing, making a normal moment into a memorable moment. So your, your, your son is not great at cleaning. Okay? One day he cleans something. All of a sudden, you make that into. Majestic moment. <laughs> oh my God, mashallah. And then you, you mention it a day later, you mention it two days later, you mention it three days later, you mention it a week later. All of a sudden it builds him. It defined him. It defines who he is. And now all of a sudden, a month later, now he's, I'm, I'm, I'm a cleaner. I clean my room. Right? So you made it into a moment. I'm going to go faster. Now number seven, part of that is to do reinforcing stories. What does that mean? So we'll be in the car, our child's in the back, and we'll be talking to each other, knowing that they're listening, but acting like we don't know they're listening. And I'll say, hey, do you know today, you know, so-and-so, they cleaned their room all by themselves. I went in there, it was so clean. Of course they're listening, you know? But I act like they're not, you know? And then and then she knows what I'm doing. And she's like, oh, wow, what did, what did he do? Yeah, the closet was so clean, the drawers were impeccable, and his clothes were hung up a little... And so all of a sudden you're talking about it in front of him. Now be careful if you do the opposite and talk about negative characteristics, you're doing the same thing. You're reinforcing the negative. Okay, so that's seven, seven, eight. Okay, next is, oh yeah, the natural group. We already did, we already did that. Uh, okay, one-on-one uh, -on -one trips, very healthy. You have more than one child, take them one-on-one. -on -one. Go have sushi with them. Take them out to the park alone. If you have to travel to Florida, to Washington, Take one-on-one -on -one trips. It's very healthy. It builds the bond. Um, next, we talked about this. Translate your ads. These are prophetic prayers. They're not from us. They work. One time I translated uh, the du'a for clothes for my, like, five-year-old or something. And I was like, thank you, Allah, for giving me this clothes, even though I don't deserve it. And then she was like, I do deserve it. <laughs> and I was like, that's the nefs. You see that nefs? And he goes, and we had a conversation, right? That Allah gives us this. We can't, we can't. So, but translating du'as of the car, of leaving the house, of food, everything, translating them all before the du'a before you sleep, they, they're from the Prophet Sallallahu so they, they shape paradigms, right? Okay, next, we kind of mentioned this, a healthy discomfort. Mm -hmm. Discomfort is healthy because you're building resilience, they don't have this entitlement, etc. We talked about that. Uh, next, don't give choices because choices, again, is disappointment. So it, it relates to health, uh, healthy discomfort. 
You, you're you're going to go buy a sandwich, buy 10 chicken sandwiches. Don't say this one gets no lettuce, this one extra tomato, mm -hmm. this one double fried bun, this one a lot. <laughs> you know, because then, basically, they have all this criteria to be happy. Mm -hmm. They have 10 criteria to be satisfied with their sandwich instead of one chicken sandwich. Mm -hmm. You know? And so you're setting them up. I need a customized sandwich to be happy. And if I don't get it, so what's going to happen when they're 20 years old and they don't get what they want? You create a monster. You create a monster, and then whenever they're uncomfortable with something, they want to change it. Mm -hmm. I'm uncomfortable with my shoes, change it. I'm uncomfortable with my sandwich, change it. I'm uncomfortable with my jacket, change it. I'm uncomfortable with my wife. I'm uncomfortable with my religion. I'm uncomfortable with my school. Let's take you to another school. I'm uncomfortable. You know, so we don't do that. No. We, we embrace discomfort. We bring out the best. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, so, and then finally, uh, they give traditions. They give traditions. Um, they give traditions. So in your home, do they give traditions? Friday before Maghrib, do salawat for two, three, four minutes. Read Kahf together when they're really young. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when they get older, they'll, they'll be a part of their house. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that was number 13. So the seven more, I said 20, the seven remaining have to do with what happens when my child does something wrong, the discipline, the correcting. Okay, now these are really cool methods on doing that. Okay, number one, dua. Okay, number two, it's a really cool thing. Uh, it's, it's, we don't, don't do the blame game. Don't get in the blame game. Who did this? Why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? So, for example, you want to teach them how to clean the bathroom. Don't say, why would you do this? How many times did you have to do this? Why'd you? Just, just call your children. Go in the bathroom and say, hey, guys, I want to show you something. Put the toilet paper roll. Good. Fix the towel. Do the curtain. Wipe the sink. Looks nice, right? Okay. Two days later, the same thing happens. Hey, guys, I want to show you something. Go back in the bathroom. Fix the towel. Wipe the sink. Close the curtain. Put the slippers. One week later, same thing happens. There's no blaming. Salah, I said, I'm Enes ibn Malik said, I served the Prophet, I said, I'm 10 years. He never told me, why did you do this? Why didn't you do this? 10 years. Okay? Uh, okay, now number three with disciplining is just model it. Don't blame, don't correct, don't yell. So even when they're two years old, for example, one time my son was in, in the back of the car. He wanted me to open the window. Why do I open the window? And he was like, Yelling. I was like, whoa, what's this? <laughs> so, so what we did was, I was just like, Baba, can you open the window? And then I would say, Tikram Aynak. And then I would say, Shukran Baba. So, Baba, can you open the window, please? Yes, sure, my, my darling. Thank you, Baba. I'd open the window. Next day, he yelled, Baba, open the window. <laughs> Baba, can you open the window? Tikram Aynak. Shukran Baba. I'd open the window. Third day, he yelled, Baba. And I just say it out loud. Baba, you can put the ashes back. Take it on my neck. Put your Baba. And I open the window. Fourth day, guess what he said? Baba, you can put the ashes back. Boom, for the rest of his life, he learned it. That's it. I didn't have to give a lecture. Don't yell. Ask nicely. I just model. Don't yell. Ask nicely. Why do you do this? Just model. Okay? Now, number four with disciplining is this really amazing thing. It's called try again. Mm -hmm. And this is so beautiful. Um, and so, let's say your child does something. Um, let's say they, 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 they place, a, they serve you a cup, and, or they give you something, and when they give it to you, they throw it. Instead of saying, option one, you can say, don't throw it, that's bad at them. All you have to say is, try again. They tell me. No lecture, no blame, no negativity. And they practiced it. And they had to figure out what they needed to try again. So it becomes it becomes internal. It's such a powerful tool. And it can be anything. They're running that they're noisy, they're running down the stairs. Try again. They go up the stairs. Walk down south. No lecture, no yelling, no negative. How many times did I have to tell you to go down the stairs? Avoid all of that. And maybe they ask you something. Why do we have to do this? Try again. 
Oh, is it okay? <laughs> so, but they had to, number one, you avoided the, the yelling. Number two, they had to figure it out. And number three, they, they practiced it so it mm -hmm. becomes a part of them. Absolutely. Okay, now, number five, with disciplining, there's a really cool thing. It's called negative positive principle. The way you can do something, like one time, my, like uh, if someone's sitting on something they shouldn't sit on, you can say, don't sit on that. Negative. You can say, can you sit there instead? Positive. Or you can say, sitting on that might, it might cause it to break. And don't tell them what to do. Now all of a sudden, they will choose the right thing to do, and they'll do it for the rest of their life. Because you gave them the principle. And that applies with everything. Even in, like, let's say you want them to start prayer on time. You can say, don't miss the, the first zirkat. Why do you always miss the first zirkat? Negative. Start with the imam. Positive. Or you can say, the one who starts with the imam gets the most reward. A, a more perfect prayer starts with the imam. Mm. You're just planting seeds. They'll blossom a year later, two years later, five years later. Planting seeds. So that's number five. Number six, uh, the disciplining. Um, private time. I'll let Amita Wait, talk what about. was five? Five was trying. Five was trying. Yeah. No, and, uh, number one, we talked about principled the other one. Parenting. Yeah. Principled parenting. Yeah. Negative, positive, principle. The Prophet did that all the time in his hadith. You'll see it in the hadith. He always gave principles. When someone did something wrong or negative or something, he wanted to correct he'd give a principle. And that's why all of his hadith, we have all these principles. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then the person does it from within their heart because they're convinced of the goodness of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, my time is up. So um, we work at entry, and one of, I think, the benefits of being at entry and the benefits of being here is you guys are also a community and you all are going through something, have been through something. So leaning in and asking, what can I learn? I'm struggling with this. What did you do? So I, I learned a lot from Hina was my predecessor, <laughs> inshallah, and I've learned so much from her and her friends. And um, they're my role models. But I think two things that really changed the way I parent and especially for my daughters, um, and it works for boys too, but I've only had experience with my girls because my boys are still younger. Um, what I developed is, um, I think I started it when my daughter was around the age of seven. Um, I told her, I, I sat her down and I said, I, I want to tell you about something that you can have with me called private time. And what private time is, it's a time for you to tell me anything, anything whether it's something you heard that you're confused about, whether you stole something, whether you lied to me about something, whether you hurt someone, whether anything, anything. There is nothing you can tell me during private time that I will be shocked about, that you will get in trouble about. All we're gonna do during private time is give you tools to fix whatever it is that's, that you're struggling with, mm -hmm. that's it. Just like, even if I tell you that I lied to you, I'm like, even if you told me that you lied to me, even if you told me, God forbid, that you killed someone, um, you're not going to get in trouble with me. It's just here for that. And she's like, can I call it whenever I want? I said, you can call it whenever you want, and I will give you the time. If I'm cooking, if I'm in the middle of cooking, I will, you know, make fix that situation, and then I will give you my full attention. So it started, and the things that have come out from that are tremendous. Um... You know, what I learned is that kids carry a lot. <laughs> um, they have a lot of confusion about themselves. Um, they're trying to understand the world. Uh, there's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of um, lying that happens. Um, and uh, it's not like, con it's somewhat like confession, <laughs> but it's not um, because they're getting tools. It's not just confess and you're forgiven. It's more like, Give me the problem and let's find a solution. So my younger daughter started seeing this. And of course, my four-year-old would start calling private time. And her private time was like, you know, my sister took this from me. Or like, I want to talk about the clouds. <laughs> but I honored it, you know. Um, and so much has come out of it. And sometimes, depending on the temperament of your child, one of my children, private time only works if I'm laying down next to her in bed and the lights are off and we're not making eye contact. And that can be especially true for boys. Um, boys don't like to make um, eye contact when they're being disciplined. Um, in Alim Tree, the role I have um, that I inherited from Hina, um, whenever a child uh, has, we have to deal with disciplinary issues at entry, I'm the one that steps in to, to talk to the child. And I notice that if I sit across from a boy, 
I'm going nowhere. I have to either walk with them and we're just both looking, you know, a great time to do this is in the car. Um, but, you know, just depending on the temperament of your child to just, you know, make sure that the situ you don't have private time in the middle of the room, make sure it's, it's, it, it has its um, right space. Um, another great tool I learned is the baggage. This is from Aisha. Um, so uh, the heavy baggage. So heavy luggage, sorry. So whenever my children want to, want to know about something that they're too young to know about, um, like many topics, like uh, for now it's like transgender, homosexuality, maybe your five or six year old is asking about that. Or, or you know, intimacy and all that stuff. So when they're around six, seven years old, again, I tell them, um, you know, when we're traveling or, or when I have a heavy suitcase, can you carry it? Would you carry it down the stairs? No, you're too young to carry it. So who carries it? Mama or Baba do. I said, just like you're too young to physically carry things, your heart and mind are also still growing, and they're too young to carry parts of this world. And there are parts of this world that you don't know about yet, but you're going to know about them. And I will tell you about them, or they might come to you. Um, but they're heavy parts of this world. It doesn't mean they're ugly. It just means they're heavy and you're not able to carry them. And if they come to you at this age, they're gonna hurt you, because you're too young to, to hold them you know, these realities. So what happens is my daughters will come to me and if they had heard some, because of course you can't control what your children get exposed to. Um, they come to you and they say, yeah, I think, I think I've, I think part of that world, the, the heavy part of the world has come to me. Um, and maybe I, I need to talk to you about it. And my daughters will say, do you think I'm ready to talk about it? And I say, well, what is it? And they'll tell me and I'll be like, oh, okay, you know, um, one of them is how are babies made, right? One of my daughters came to me at, at nine years old saying, can I know how, how that happens? And I said, well, it's part of that heavy part of the world and I don't think you're ready to hold it, but if you think you're ready, what do you think? And she's like, hmm, maybe I'll wait a little bit. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, and then when I do introduce that subject to my kids, they're around 12, 11, 12, depending on you know their maturity level, it's just, I sit them down and I say, okay, you're old enough to hold something now. So I'm going to unload something on you, and you're about to learn about a new reality of the world. And so it, you know, it gives them time to process. And the idea behind this is you don't have to be curious about things because you're going to know. It's not like it's a forbidden thing you're never going to know about. And I tell them, no matter what it is, as crazy as it sounds, I know. Because a lot of kids, the thing is, they feel that their parents don't know. Yeah. That, like... Um, let's say a nine-year-old gets exposed to pornography, they might not come to a parent because mm -hmm. there's no way my mom knows about this part of the world. So I tell them, there are parts of the world that are so crazy that you think I'm not going to know about. I know. Mm -hmm. So don't be worried. And if you get exposed to it, don't worry. It's not, it's not, any, it's not your fault, you know, because mm -hmm. when a nine-year-old gets exposed to pornography, there's no way on earth an adult wasn't a part of that, whether an adult put a screen in their hand, knowingly or unknowingly, Whatever it is, it is not your fault that you were exposed to mm -hmm. something like this. It's the society's fault. Mm -hmm. So that really helped. So this, this heavy luggage really um, worked. And then my last thing is um, whenever I'm going to uh, talk about any child, uh, whether it's my own child or when I'm talking to a child in entry that, you know, we're dealing with their struggles, we're dealing with their mistake. What I realized is um, what really helps is to approach every mistake of a child with their strength rather than their weakness. So what I start with is I say, every human is born with strengths. And I, I, I like visualize it for them. I was like, this is your strength. But every strength is enveloped in some weaknesses. It doesn't matter what the strength is. and doesn't matter what the weakness is. Every weakness is attached to a strength and every strength is attached to the weakness. This is what temperaments are, context, personality, whatever it is. And they say, Tedabia is the process of getting tools to peel back those weaknesses so that strength can shine. So let's say you're a lot, you have a child lies a lot. I'm gonna say, okay, you have a problem of lying. Usually it comes from fear, but I'd say, mashallah, Allah has given you the strength of social awareness. You're very socially aware. You're so in tune with what people need that you're able to give them exactly what they need to hear. 
part of that strength is the, the manipul part of the, the weakness of that strength is the ability to manipulate, which is lying. You manipulate the truth. You manipulate this. You manipulate that. So, don't be a, don't waste that strength through its weakness. You know. So, and and, and you can literally apply this to anything. Um, a child who's always tattletelling. That's like the Sunnah of, uh, that's like, uh, you have the strength of Sayyidina Musa, he is He was the just prophet. People who tattletell care a lot about justice. So, but the, 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 the weakness of it is that you don't know how to apply it, you misapply it, you compare a lot, you're constantly looking at the weaknesses or negati negative of others, people who care about justice. Right? So you have to, you, you give them the tools to be able to deal with that weakness. And what happens then is that they internalize the strength, not the weakness. They don't label themselves as I am this person, I'm a liar, I'm a thief, I'm a, I'm a loser, I'm a, I give up, I'm unintelligent. You know, whatever it is, you don't, you label it as a strength. And, and that, um, with my students and with my own children, has really had a profound uh, effect, alhamdulillah. I mean, it's all from Fadl Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But may Allah protect them. So those those three things are from... I'd share one more. Sorry. No, 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 please, go ahead. Just to that. No, no, no. There's one more video with this woman that's really nuanced and very important, and it's the timing of advice. Yeah, this is Because the timing of advice could make the advice fail or succeed, it can make what you're advising about seem they can fall in love with it or hate it. Like for example, you want them to read Quran. Like I once witnessed this. There are these, there are these, there are these teenagers, and they want to. We're gonna go watch a movie, and they were excited, and they found the movie, and they're gonna go to the theater, and it's like you know 10 p.m. and they're all excited, and they're walking out the door and everything, and then the dad comes in and he's like, he's like, no, everyone sit down and read Quran. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, I was so cringing because, not because, because now they're going to astaghfirullah al Yeah, yeah. What am I going to Detest the Quran? Yeah. Like, astaghfirullah, like, they're going to resent, like, yeah. you know, and then he started mentioning, like, names of our teachers and scholars. Why can't you be like so-and-so? And I'm just like... Yeah. Like, now they're going to hate the scholars. They're going to hate yeah. these scholars. Hate yeah. And so it killed me. So, for example, flipping that, let's say they're doing a, a chore. They're mowing the lawn. They're they're cleaning the house. And they're so tired. And they just want to be done with it. And they'd be like, okay, fine, fine, fine. You know what? Fine. You, you stay, I'll just, you please, let me just, fine. You know, <coughs> fine. Just, you know, go. I'll let you go read five pages of Quran. <laughs> Yay! Yes! <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, the timing of advice can be critical in how they receive it and accept it. And sometimes we have to wait and pause advice yeah. until a moment and say it in a way and in a manner and in a timing where it becomes embraced and accepted by them. You know, our Prophet said, what's up with people? Why do they do this? You know, you generalize it. You say it three weeks later about someone else. You tell them a story, so you plan it out. Oh, I heard you know such and such person, and it has... And they're not going to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. But you plan the dots. You can even do it six months later, three months later. Mm -hmm. They won't connect the dots, but you are connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with that exact thing you want to share with them, but it's not demeaning them or belittling them. Yeah, so sure. the timing of advice is very important. And all of these things we're saying are, are very nuanced mm -hmm. parenting things. I think some of the things that are so obvious are not being said, like, don't give your child an iPhone. Yeah. You know, don't give your child a laptop. Yeah. Yeah. You know, beware of public school. Yeah. You know, like some of these very yeah. obvious things, we're not saying them, yeah. you know, because, screen danger. you know, like yeah. screen yeah. danger, an iPhone's Doesn't more matter. dangerous than a gun. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. some of these things are more obvious. We didn't say them, but I just, you know, I'm just yeah. putting it yeah. out Yeah, there. no, mashallah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys for that, uh, mashallah. Very comprehensive list. Lots of really great ideas there, mashallah. Um, I just want to open up to, I know we're, we're getting to that time when uh, everyone's getting tired and it's been a long Tuesday, mashallah, but I want to give our audience some time to ask some questions, uh, if you guys have any, have any thoughts or questions. And also, if you guys feel like, you know, there's anything additional to add to the list, inshallah, please go ahead and feel free to I wish I could redo it. The iPhone battle is increasing. Yeah. When it came in 2007, it seems like it was only 2007 when we got the iPhone 3. 
um, it was a battle for teenagers, maybe 16. No, and then you see five. 14 year olds have it, and now nine year olds are battling. Mm -hmm. Like they, yeah. they feel nine year old feels like they have the right, yeah. right? Yeah. Because it's a comparison thing. So your your sohba, your family unit, Absolutely. and the extended village has to have those standards. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, you know you have to be the unpopular, be willing to, like Mary yeah. said, be willing to say the no, um, and to constantly fight that battle yeah. uh, because it's it's like a loaded gun. And, and, and model it as an adult because and we're on our we're on our phones a lot too, you know. Don't read right. your Quran on your phone. Your kids don't know that you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Pick up a mushaf and like don't read your books on your phone. Pick up a book. Mm -hmm. Go get it from the library. Kids, my mother, um, my elder lives with us. My brother lives with us, and it's so much easier for her to read Quran on the phone. And I actually requested from her. I was like, Mama, like I, I want I a core memory I have is seeing my grandma read Quran. Mm -hmm. Just I was playing around that. It's like my kids don't know that's what you're doing mm -hmm. when you're in the living room on the phone. Mm -hmm. So I asked her, I was like, please, can you read from the mushaf mm -hmm. so that your your grandkids can see you reading Quran, right? Yeah, so yeah. so do things, get off, for us, before we tell kids to not have a phone, we need to get off our own phones. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. have have no screen time in your house. Have like a no screen rule on the table for yourself um, before your kids. Yeah, one of the best pieces of advice uh, Imam Zaid gave when our kids were little, and we asked the question back then, we didn't have smartphones, but we asked about TV and movies and all that. And he said, expose your children to screen time TV in homeopathic doses. Yeah. Meaning that if you uh, completely tell them, absolutely not, you're not gonna have it at all, then mm -hmm. when they are around it, they go crazy. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and I've seen that happen with other people's Screens. kids who weren't allowed it at all, um, not having self-control mm -hmm. when they were around it. And then if, and I, I had a friend who once, uh, so we would do family movie night in our home. So there'd be no TV all week, but Saturday night as a family, we would have a movie that was approved and we would all watch it together. And um, I remember gradually over time, uh, Zishan and I wanted our time to watch a movie. So we started like setting the kids up with their movie that we knew was okay for them to watch. And then Zishan and I would watch ours. And I remember my eldest son, oh, in those days we had borders in San Ramon, like Barnes and Noble, and they'd be open till you know, 11 o'clock at night, midnight. And we used to often take the kids there uh, to read books and get hot chocolate. And so one family movie night, Sean said to me, Mama, do you think we can go to borders instead and read books and have hot chocolate? And I said, yeah, we could, but then you would lose out on your movie night, like the one movie you get to see during the week don't you want to have your movie night? And he said, yeah, but the whole point of movie night was that we would watch it together. Mm -hmm. and, but we're not doing that anymore, so we might as well just, let's go to Borders. And, we'll, mm. and that's when I realized that it wasn't even the movie so mm. much that was so attractive. It was the family the family bonding, bonding the family yeah, time together. Yeah, sure. And then the other thing I would say with movies, a core memory of mine is a, a friend that I you know, co-parented with. She, we raised our kids together. She one day called me like, really upset saying that, um, you know, why do you let your boys watch these PG-13 movies? Because her kids weren't allowed to, and she said, and my boys tell me, well, the Mukhtars are allowed to, why can't we? And the Mukhtars are even younger than us. And I was kind of like, oh, I'm sorry, oh, and I felt guilty, like, but then when we talked about it, she came to the conclusion herself, she said what she realized, the key difference was that the PG-13 movies that we allowed our kids to watch at 10, 11, was we watched it together, yeah so that we forwarded parts that weren't appropriate or explained things that might be too advanced. Right. Where she didn't watch movies. For her, she just needed a movie she could put on for her kids to watch yeah. and it'd be safe. Yeah. So she wasn't there to help them filter it. Exactly. So that was the key difference. It wasn't that I just let them watch PG-13 yeah. or rated R movies. So that's, um, again, getting your voice into your kids' heads and yeah. allowing them to learn how to decide for the world. Around them. So I think you encourage that, even for yeah. the movies that are like, the okay. non-approved movies. Yeah, yeah. Like, right. watch it with your children. Talk about it. Pause it. Like, you see what message they just planted in your heart? Mm, yeah. You dissect the language, the hidden premise. Mm. You see what they just did to you? Oh, my God, I didn't notice that. Yeah, I see how they're controlling you. See how they put that music and they make this guy like this and now you're supporting, the, you're supporting this villain. You want him to do this. And it's so haram and you support it and you love him and support him. Yeah. Oh, my God, I didn't yeah. know. Mm -hmm. So then you dissect it, you know, and then you forward through these parts so you're modeling it so and then there's a so it, I encourage that it's a teachable moment yeah. and 
then there's a really cool service called VidAngel. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. VidAngel is amazing. It's a really cool uh, filtering service. service. Yeah, yeah. Filtering it service. filters movies. VidAngel and also MindfulnessSomereader.com yeah. yeah. is a new website <laughs> that Mira and we, her close friends, have come out with. It's an excellent website. Everybody should be using yeah. it to Did choose books for their children. It's called MindfulMuslimReader.com. Yes. And okay. they've gone through years of reading books, yeah. mashallah, mm -hmm. and choosing books that are worthy of reading to your children, with your children, to come up with talking points. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's anything problematic, mentioning <coughs> that, but not canceling the book out totally. They have very high standards for what makes for good reading, and so it's finally we have a website. Yes. I like Thank Common you Sense Media as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think Common Sense Media is a really good tool also for, for parents to kind of filter some of the things that might be in, in media. So any questions? No? MashaAllah, good. Yeah. Um, it's 14 too late to start the <laughs> Man, that's when you befriend them. <laughs> yeah, we can switch back. So, the other method back. still works. Like, yeah. it's, it's never too late. It's like never planting too late. these seeds, like watching the movies together, for example, yeah. talking about these Doing ideas, friendship having things. the one on one trips, yeah. you know, together. Like these, these, you know, some tools work at younger ages, some tools work at older ages. Yeah. So it's, it's never too late. And then do I. Allah is the flipper of hearts, the turner yeah. of hearts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, I did have a question. So if you're kind of midway in your parenting journey and there's some kids that are a little older and you've done some stuff wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like obviously amazing advice and like instantly want to go and change ten things, but how do you kind of like you just start modeling the, the newer, nicer practices and you know, hopefully like hope that that's what over time gets reinforced or do you have a conversation about it with you? Yeah, I think both. So there's two things uh, on them. One is uh, you model it for, you know, if you start eating salads, your, your family will start eating salads a year later. You know? So if you start exercising, your kids will start exercising two years later. So model it and have trust that it'll happen uh, with the modeling. Uh, you know, uh, so so that's the, that that is part of it. Of course, draw, 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 draw. Mm -hmm. um, the conversation, if there's going to be a shift, the conversation uh, can be beneficial, um, depending on a, you, know, you know, framed positively and depending on the maturity uh, of the child. Um, but the conversation can because um, it takes. You know, it it, it takes uh, these ideas sometimes to marinate, and so sometimes when you state the idea, it helps the marination process. Um, and you know, and that's even a method of you know our shuyu, our teachers, where they will they you know they'll share a hadith and they'll share something, and they'll they'll wait a year or two or three, you know, waiting for that to you know to blossom. You know, so um, definitely like. You know, a conversation of, you know what, we've been parenting this way where, you know, um, you, you know, where you were the boss. <laughs> and, you know, I don't think that's the best way to proceed. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, and, and having, uh, you know, having a conversation, but finding the right words for yeah. it. You know, finding the right words. So, so both are, both can be useful. And what surprise our kids is sometimes we just say, we'll go back to this yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah, having yeah. a parent that says, you know what, I wanted to do it this way, or this is the way I was doing it, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm fallible. Mm -hmm. I messed up, and I want to do it better. Mm -hmm. And these are the reasons. Mm -hmm. Maybe you let the kids watch an R rated movie, mm -hmm. and you can use Amira's heavy luggage thing. There's things in there that are part of this world that are going to confuse you. And, you know, and so I'm sorry, and I'm going to do better, and I want you to help me do better. We're all on our journeys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's not what you did wrong. It's it's that I need to guide you better. Mm -hmm. right? I'm a, I'm a, I was not as good a leader. And so when they admit that, when they realize that you're fallible and you mm -hmm. can make mistakes and you're human, then, you know, they can excuse, they can make the mistakes themselves if they don't think they can come to you. Yeah. That trust is built. Yeah. That's right. So trust it's it's, it's, a, it's a really so uh, paradigm-shifting thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you, you know, when you apologize to your children, even for when you lose it, yeah. Or when you don't have good other with somebody else, your parent, or 
when you're overly strict, um, you know, so I think that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. As long as it doesn't undermine the premise that right. the mm -hmm. parent is a boss. Yeah. 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 Child's not the boss, because that's very yeah. important, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things we tried to do was, like, Allah is our boss, right? Yeah, yes. Like yeah. recognizing yeah. that these things don't necessarily come from us, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and recognizing that we are on, like you said, on that journey as well, mm -hmm. and that that that's where we're trying to align ourselves yeah. with as well. Yeah. And so there's a higher exactly. And I'll say we've been on the phone too long. Yeah. We can yeah. all mm -hmm. we can all say that. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna be better, and I'm gonna do it. Our 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 rule in our house was we don't engage with the internet behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. always in public places. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. So the kitchen table, whatever, even if we're on the phone, and there's yeah. a limit to it, we say, oh, yeah. I can be better. Mm -hmm. So uh, they'll see that, you know, come from them, it'll be much more regulated. Yeah, yeah. and so. as they get older, just of the question, <coughs> this question um, no charging of the phones in the, uh, private bedrooms, mm -hmm. and not even using the phones as alarm clocks. Get yeah. a real alarm Get a real alarm clock. So Get the phones out of the bedrooms. Yeah. Yeah. From yeah. CVS, Rite Aid, they have the old fashioned digital ones to plug yeah. in. I'm actually a question. Sorry. No, no, I'm I'm one of the older kids. Okay. Um, I have four. I had three younger brothers. I was essentially a second mother. Okay. Um, my daughter, she's 14. She has two younger brothers. My daughters, they're essentially second mothers. Yeah. Um, my older brother was essentially a second father to my three younger brothers, and. You have to, the sibling relationship isn't momentary. It's a long-term relationship. When I had my kids, who took care of me? My brothers, right? So it's a give and take. There are times in the relationship where the elder is going to be giving to the younger. But there are times when the elder is going to be in need and the younger siblings step in. Mm -hmm. And it's really beautiful to watch. And they're paying, it's not like they're paying their dues, but they are. But the only reason they're there for me, the only reason my brothers were there for me when I needed them as an adult, although they were like 15-year-old boys, mm -hmm. is because they remember me doing that for them. So it's a long-term relationship. It's not a short-term relationship. And yeah, but birth order is important and it's okay you know, yeah. there's a lot you don't have to teach your child by the mere fact that they have younger siblings. Mm -hmm. You don't have to teach them service. It's just going to happen naturally. Mm -hmm. So that's a blessing in disguise, really. It is mm -hmm. that, that they have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. The older one takes care of the younger one, but the other one calls him pipe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even though there's they get respect. taken care of, they give respect. So, yeah. you know, it's part of life. There's an hierarchy. And, and then, yeah. again, I think. We don't do it as much, but we've seen it as just the one-on-one -on -one time. Have the one-on-one -on -one yeah. time for the 18-year-old, the middle one. Like, oh, I love that. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and ask them these questions, you know, and they'll tell you. We, we ask our kids, well, what could, you, could we have done better? And, you know, um, definitely, you know, they wanted to do more intramural sports on the weekends. I mean, what was that? <laughs> it was like they wish they did more football and baseball yeah. and soccer, and, you know, yeah. outside. But we were building Elm Tree. We were yeah. working, so we sure. didn't have that. So they gave us a pass. I mean, they knew, but the yeah. piece conversations are really yeah. important yeah. to Absolutely. see what they're going to do with their kids. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, 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 I, I love the one-on-one uh, -on -one because mm -hmm. when I moved here from Arizona five years ago, my daughter is in sixth grade here, and I realized she was going to first grade, and this is when I realized that certain things has changed in her life, and she's being stuck to be living, um, not really what she used to do. Obviously, moving a huge thing. And then um, the thing that came to my mind was so I need to spend more one-on-one -on -one time with her. Yeah. And with both of us, like my husband and I, specifically lock some time every week just to spend with each other. And alhamdulillah, within six, seven months, I saw. Yeah, saw a huge change. difference. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. 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 She needs yeah. to just be able to get to realize it. Alhamdulillah. Like, we work on it. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Much more. It's always a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you yes. all for attending. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. sure. When you're doing the private time mm -hmm. and your child confesses they lied to you or whatever, do you share that with your husband? <laughs> so there are times where my daughters will say, are you going to tell Baba? You know, and I will. <laughs> so I do. But I don't tell them that I do. And now, now my, if my 14-year-old is doing that, it might be different. You know, like if she's talking about a boy, for example. You know, I might not, I'll honor that. But if my seven-year-old is, she doesn't need to know that I'm telling her dad. Because mm -hmm. the, the trust here is, uh, as long as her dad knows never to mention it in front of yeah. her, because that'll break. Because there's nothing more important than trust, mm -hmm. both ways. Absolutely. Um, 
but yeah, you know, I don't, I might not necessarily tell him every detail. I'll, I'll, uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, wait a minute. <laughs> but we're on the same page. <laughs> What's the drawback of sharing if a 14 year old tells you something about abortion? Oh, I mean, <laughs> you share it, but you don't have to share the details. So you yeah, do share it because yeah, I just, yeah, know. yeah, yeah, like, yeah, because we're, we're a team. Like, like, no, I'm, just, I'm sharing this yeah, for the yeah. benefit of yeah, yeah, yeah. the conversation. Or, or, but, yeah. I mean, I think sharing it, sharing it with the spouse is 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 the healthy move. Absolutely. Yeah. Without yeah. the child knowing. Yeah, oh, the child can know. Or 17 know. or 20 or 25. Yeah. It, I mean, I yeah, it's like adults. should know. Yeah. Yeah. As, assuming they're intelligent parents and wise yes. parents and they're yeah. not going to mm -hmm. mess up with yeah. their information. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. I think that, that, that communication obviously is really crucial. And then sometimes you do get support from your spouse. Who's, you know, you find yourself stuck with what type of advice do I give? And when you, whenever yeah. you're bouncing those ideas off of someone, yeah, you, you get definitely ask. Yeah. But yeah, there's definitely times when, um, you know, you you mull things over. Isn't well, there a story about some girl who used to write in a journal, that's, but she knew yeah. her mom would read it? Yeah, yeah I was, I was that was so say, beautiful. Yeah. Please share yeah, because that's where I actually that. got private time yeah. from. I for me, talking is easier than writing. Yeah, yeah but this that was is a, a friend of ours. She had a teenage daughter who's coming of age and. You know, she wanted her to feel safe sharing things with her, but she knew her daughter had a hard time. So she got a journal, and she put the journal by her bed, and she told her daughter, you can write anything you want in this, and then I will respond. And so she said her daughter would take the journal, and she would write pages and pages of, like, whatever was going on with her and what she was struggling with. And then she would just put the journal back, and then the mom would read it, and then the mom would write her response back in it. And so she said days went by with the journal just went back and forth. They never talked about it in person, mm -hmm. face to face, but it got addressed through this journal. I uh, can say that with my sons, we've had some really deep conversations via text yeah. while mm -hmm. being in the same house mm -hmm. yeah. because they don't feel comfortable yeah. talking face to face about something, but we, you know, texting Gives you a chance to look at how you're wording it, deleting yeah. it, editing it, then sending it. You think, and you think slower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, that, I thought that was a, a beautiful example. And then yeah. what Amira was saying with my boys, I saying, I saw exactly what you said, that some of our deepest conversations happen in the car yeah. when neither of us could look at each other. Yeah. And some deep truths came out while staring at the road ahead. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the eye contact. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things I'm getting is, subhanAllah, like, our sense of autonomy as human beings. And we forget sometimes that, you know, our spouses have that autonomy and they make their decisions. And that our children have their autonomy and they make their decisions. And that as teachers and parents and households, all we can really do is create an environment. And... We create that environment from, by our words, mm -hmm. by the little things that we do, by the ambiance that we create, by the conversations that we have, by the things that we prioritize above other things. And so I think being mindful of like what our practices are, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we have our, our coach at the school is a, a, um, a personal trainer and I was talking about eating healthier and he said, are you mindful of what you're eating? And all, now that I'm thinking about it, there's so many things that you eat where you're not even thinking about it. Yeah. And so our daily actions are really like an accumulation of all these little things that we do that we're on autopilot, where we're not pausing and thinking. Yes. We might be on our phones without even recognizing that we're on our phones, mm -hmm. or we might have certain reactions that we might not even think about. So. I think one of the major things that I'm kind of taking from, you know, this dialogue is that we all have that sense of autonomy and we all make our decisions and our children are going to make their own decisions. And ultimately, the thing that we can do as parents and the responsibility that we have is to provide that kind of sense of um, space for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. to um, create them regarding that ambiance, like safe space, you know, the timing of the advice. Yeah. It's prophetic in the sense where Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our prophet, in a beautiful way where um, would overlook mistakes and flaws mm -hmm. and he would accept every excuse of anyone who gave him an excuse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Even if he knew it was a wrong excuse, mm -hmm. false excuse, or a or a 
why you put mm-hmm. this so we accept it. Yeah. Why? Because it maintains the dignity of the relationship, exactly. yes. which yes. is more important than that specific mistake mm-hmm. in your heart. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So Absolutely. it maintains the relationship mm-hmm. overlooking that particular flaw. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. And it's called the Rafal or the Jahal in, in Arabic. Overlooking and creating that space. And it, like uh, if something would break, if someone made a mistake, our Prophet would say, Kada Qada. Yeah. Kada Qada. That's that's how it was decreed. Yeah. Yeah. Or he would say, mm-hmm. Let him be, because this was in a book written. Mm-hmm. So so now in our yeah. house, someone makes a mistake, someone makes the, the child, the four year old, saying, So what do you do? You slap him, and you're like, <laughs> 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 No, but yeah, no, 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 no slapping. <laughs> but no, but I'll let protect them, yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely really, really Islam, important. Yeah. Islam just has to work. It has yeah. to work in the home. Yeah. It has to work in the relationships. Show them the beautiful aunts and uncles, relationships, yeah. marriages that work. Absolutely. Um, make sure that you're being prophetic. And then, inshallah, that's yeah. that's when they have a chance. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so that do all we, first of we have to, yeah. Yeah, we have to yeah. do and, and ask Allah to help you yeah. be that person that yeah. they can look up Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Uh, my two sons went to a class, a social studies class, and they tell the story is that the, the professor told everyone to raise their hands up. They said, um, put your hands down if your parents are in a happy marriage. And m- half the hands went down. Okay, so a few, half the hands were up. And, and now put your hands down if your parents uh, like what they do for work. And all the hands went down except no, my... No, put your hands down if your parents don't like what they do. Don't like what they yeah. do, And right. they all put their They hands all put their hands down. So the, the, there are four hands up in the it was my, my two sons, alhamdulillah, from Allah. And then Fatima and Noor, of another family in San Ramon, their two daughters, and we know their parents, but they both have a happy marriage, and alhamdulillah, both parents like what they do for work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're in a society where look, how many people are really, really struggling. Mm-hmm. And these are child, college-age children making this statement about their parents and their situation, mm-hmm. their marriages and what they do, for them, whether they're happy. Yeah. So this is this is how the odds are against us. But mashallah, I look at this religion and I uh, do that story. I'm like, mashallah, you know, two Muslim homes in San yeah. 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 right? Yeah. And we know the quality of the other two yeah. parents and yeah. how they parent Fatima and Noor. Absolutely. So it's a very, very alhamdulillah. We're so blessed to have this religion Absolutely. and the uh, the the prophetic example yeah. and the parents and how we share each other. I learned so much today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. for having like, this fireside chat oh, uh, initiative. Yeah. yeah, Islam, we were taught Islam is good for our akhirah, which it absolutely is. But we forget that it's actually excellent for our dunya. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Islam is for dunya just as much just as much as it is for your akhirah. It, is a, it gives you a happy dunya and a happy afterlife. Happy life and happy afterlife. Not a difficult life for a happy afterlife. Mm-hmm. That is, yeah, that's, mm-hmm. that's like Christ, that's Christianity, mm-hmm. right? That's mm-hmm. their version of religion. Suffer for that's not ours it's Allah gave us the recipe for a healthy life so we can have a healthy afterlife I, I mean on that note uh, you know pre-Islam they were burying their daughters alive yeah. right and I just visited that graveyard I oh, visited wow. that graveyard a few days yeah. ago where they buried their daughters alive oh, it's still preserved yeah. and then our Prophet Sallallahu came and when his daughter would walk in the room full of men he would stand up walk to her uh, hold her hand, kiss her on the head, bring her and say, sit in my seat, sit in my seat, sit in my spot. And on his way home from a journey, he would visit his daughter's home before he would go to his own home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, th- these are part of parenting, you know? Yeah. Where you make your daughter feel special. Yeah. You make yeah. your son feel special. Yeah. You're my partner, you're my buddy. I, I love being with you. I-, I-, I love hearing you this. So you make them feel like you love their presence, you know? How special was say the say the Prophet in the field of the Prophet? Mm-hmm. He would remember her when they, when they had bread and some meat. He made a sandwich and said, "Take this to the Prophet." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She hasn't had this in, mm-hmm. in a long time. He would send her food. You know how special did she feel? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and so we can also when we get that you know that donut with the ice cream inside, and send the <laughs> you know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then she'll feel so special. I want to take her out to a donut. 
filled ice cream filled donut, you know? <laughs> really? And, and, and say that soon. <laughs> and say that soon. <laughs> and we're going to practice soon. I go out for ice cream. <laughs> and on, on, on the ice cream, I know it's 9 o'clock. So, uh, so here's my farewell. You know, if you forget everything else, just remember this. Uh, one day as a parent, I want you to have a Hagen Dazs dinner. Yeah. <laughs> so I want you to get like 10 pints of Hagen Dazs. Yeah. Okay. Flip them all upside down, okay? One and in one yeah. big bowl. And then I want you to get like all this like uh, chopped up uh, strawberries and mangoes or kiwi, something, put it on top. And then get all these M&Ms and nuts and chocolate syrup and caramel and whipped cream and everything, put it on top. And make this mountain of ice cream. And then get whoever's there in your house, five spoons, seven spoons, ten spoons. And say, all right, guys, it's dinner time. And bring them all. And put the spoons all around and say, let's have dinner. And like, what? And then, oh, what's the score? And then you, and you guys all have dinner and, and everyone gets 2,000 calories. And that's it. You know? And it becomes a memory for the family. Yeah, yeah. 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 memories, yeah. Fill in those, those moments. Yes. One day, absolutely. take them out of school early, early dismissal. Yeah. Trust me, that's not going to affect their college or their career. Yeah. <laughs> take them out of school early. I take them out early. And then take them out and just be like, I have a principal's cut day. Principal, oh, where I cut school with my kids one day. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's important. Take them out to lunch. Take them out to ice skating. Yeah, Yeah. I want to take you out ice skating. One of my strongest memories is I'm from SoCal, OC, is when my my mom drove past our school exit and exited to Disneyland. Oh. Just kept going. Uh, I was eight years old. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing I'll say is it really does go yeah. by so fast. Yeah, it does and go so fast. things yeah. that I feel like we just did yesterday now mm-hmm. are childhood memories for our kids. Yeah. And it really, really hit me when I heard them talking to their friends about favorite memories from childhood. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's mm-hmm. literally like, I feel like I could find it on my calendar on my mm-hmm. iPhone like yeah. when we did that. Yeah. And so it does. They say in parenting, yeah. the years are long. The days, days are long, long, but the, the years, years are short. short. And it's so true. It's yeah. so true. So so enjoy it. Yeah. 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 Thank, you. Thank you. Can we do a closing yeah. door? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Protect our children, Ya Allah, mm-hmm. from atheism and agnosticism and all the other crazy ideas. Uh, as Sayyidina Ruth said, Ya Allah, protect me and my family from what they do. Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to protect our teachers and our scholars, Ya Allah, and reward them and their families and their children. Mm-hmm. We ask you to take care of our children, Ya Allah, and give us wisdom, Ya Allah. Wisdom is from you. And Ya Allah, don't let us be arrogant, Ya Allah. Protect us, use our tongue with wisdom, Ya Allah, to, to, to help our children grow and navigate this world beautifully, Ya Allah. And surround our children with good friends. Surround them with righteous companions that take them to Jannah, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, and give them righteous spouses, Ya Allah, that take them to Jannah. And give them ease in this world and the next world and protect them from the torment of the hellfire, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, here we are gathering, Ya Allah, and Ya Allah, whoever walks to you, you run to them. Here we are walking to you for the sake of our children, for the sake of their futures, and our grandchildren. Ya Allah, we're scared for our grandchildren. Ya Allah, we're frightened for our grandchildren and their children, Ya Allah. Mm-hmm. Protect all of our progeny and make them happy in this life and the next. Make them from the awliya. Make them of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Help us reflect the Muhammadan character, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah, we thank you and bless this school, Ya Allah, and bless this community, and bless the organizers, and the volunteers, and the leaders, Ya Allah, and the followers, and the supporters, and the patrons, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we turn to you, and we ask you for everything good that our dear leader, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, asked you for, and we seek protection from every harm and sought protection from him. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifun, Wa Salamun Ala Al-Mursaleen, Wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. 
إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيد المرسلين الصلاة والسلام عليك يا خاتم النبيين الصلاة والسلام عليك يا من أرسلك الله رحمة للعالمين رضي الله تعالى عن أصحاب رسول الله أجمعين الفاتحة